This week, setting the record straight, lunar cities and flying elephants. Possession of illegal drugs comes with consequences. And until recently, Americans caught carrying marijuana could have earned a conviction. But now, recreational use of the drug has been decriminalized in some states, and those previously convicted can ask for their records to be expunged. The problem is it's been a slow, lengthy and expensive process, forcing less wealthy individuals to have to live with their criminal records. But now an artificially intelligent algorithm is helping those who want to wipe the slate clean. Dave Lee has been investigating. Anthony Turner co-owns a tiny cafe just outside the city of Los Angeles. It's a remarkable turnaround for a man whose teenage years left him with a number of convictions that eventually saw him sent to prison for 12 years. Some of the charges were related to cannabis and, many years on, his criminal record still greatly affects his daily life. If you've been convicted of a crime in the county of Los Angeles in the state of California, you can't get a dog walker's license. You can't fly a drone. I can never adopt kids. My son, at 15 years old, I can't coach his Little League team because I'm a convicted felon. At the weekends, Anthony runs what are known as expungement clinics. These are places members of the community can go to get free assistance in removing or reducing their criminal record. This one is funded by a new law that Californians passed in 2016 that made cannabis legal for everyone in the state. As part of that law, people who were convicted of marijuana offences that would no longer be illegal can now apply to have them scrubbed from their record. Clinics like this are of course vital, but they're also obviously really inefficient. People have to come to the building, they have to meet with lawyers who are working for free over the weekend, and they have to fill in a bunch of forms that takes a long time. That's why in San Francisco, they've been working on a way to take this entire process and make it automated. Code for America is a non-profit organization that brings Silicon Valley thinking to government technology. Engineers here have created an incredible algorithm that is able to quickly scrape past marijuana cases and automatically find criminal records that are eligible to be expunged. The estimates are it takes an attorney between 20 and 30 minutes to review a criminal record. In some instances, it's, it can be 15 minutes. In any case, that's one record reviewed in 15 minutes. Um, leveraging our technology, the DA can review thousands of records in just a couple minutes. In an unprecedented and groundbreaking move, the technology was adopted by San Francisco's district attorney. In a matter of minutes, 9,362 eligible cases, dating as far back as 1975, were identified and will soon be expunged by a judge. We created this war on drugs. We harm many communities throughout the years. And I say we, I'm talking about the criminal justice system, society in general. And I felt that we had an obligation to right that wrong. So this is a process that I felt was important to reduce the marginalization that we have created. At Code for America, there is hope that this type of technology can be applied not only to the justice system, but to other areas where Americans, particularly poor Americans, need help fast. We've got a lot of people in the country right now who need a real safety net. They need to sort of get bounced back when they hit a hard spot and they need the criminal justice system not to sort of pull them down into a cycle of what can become persistent poverty and incarceration. Earlier this month, Los Angeles County announced it too would begin using Code for America's algorithm. It is expected that as many as 50,000 people in this region alone might quickly have their records cleared. By having certain things on your record, it closes doors to more opportunities. And by expunging them, it'll 
might reopen his doors. I want to just get this off, get clean, do what I have to do, and have a better life, I guess you can say, than what I do now. It makes me feel a lot better that I, I'm not a felon. It's not a complete solution, campaigners say, but it is being seen as one major step in the right direction. I mean, courts are overwhelmed, uh, judges are overwhelmed, uh, DAs are overwhelmed, and this, uh, these algorithms can actually streamline that process. I mean, they're reading 500,000 lines of data in under 90 seconds. Like, we live in a technological age. This is the way that we're supposed to be doing business. And if it streamlines government, saves taxpayers money, and makes us safe, it's a no-brainer. Having a criminal past is complicated and controversial. No algorithm will be able to solve the wider societal disagreements about how to handle those who break the law, even laws that no longer exist. Not everyone believes criminal records should be removed. I say to those who feel that it's tough luck, what they should do is look into themselves and ask themselves what they have wanted to be forgiven for in them, their lives. Have they ever asked for forgiveness? Because that's what you're doing with the society. You're asking not just for a specific person forgiveness, but you're asking the world to forgive you. That was Anthony Turner talking to Dave Lee. Now, when was the last time you wrote a letter? I mean, actually hand wrote one. I know, right? It's all about the tippy tappy typing these days, isn't it? Well, IMR Metab has been looking at a way that machine learning could help write things for you in your own script. But is it good enough to fool the human eye? Is my handwriting really that bad? Yes. Yeah, it is. <laughs> Meet Hemingway. This little robot is doing something that I hate, writing a letter. But this one is particularly special because it's doing it in my style of handwriting. This is writing in exactly my style. And the way Hemingway here learned how to write in my style is that I sent this piece of paper in with this sample text. This took me 15 minutes to write. Hemingway can do it in two. After sending through my written text, the handwriting company scans it and puts it through its machine learning algorithm to figure out how I write my letters. So the interesting thing about our tech is we mimic what humans do. Humans are completely unique. Every time you draw a character, it's going to be a tiny, tiny bit different. And we pick up on those nuances. So our technology will learn how you do those, and it will also mimic all the variation that you apply to this, and then generate more on top of it. It's, you know, not just printing the words on paper. It's applying pressure at certain points where I apply pressure. It's being able to do that. The G, I do a G like that without a curl at the bottom, so does this. Just subtle little things. It, it's got it down to a T. This is wicked. Look at that. It's all very impressive. And even if I write underneath the robot's line, you can see that the results are very similar. There are small details like little flicks of the pen that set mine apart. But why would anyone want a handwritten letter nowadays? So it might seem a bit counterintuitive, but uh, the noise, you get so many emails a day and you barely read half of them. So it's about cutting through that noise and it's adding kind of a personal touch. So we work with big political organizations and they send it out. Hotels uh, use it for kind of adding a personal touch um, or maybe even your exams. Well, to see how convincing this robot really is, I brought in graphologist Adam Brand to see if he could tell which is which. The bottom one is written by a human being. The top one is mechanical. Oh, uh, <laughs> yeah, that, yeah, that is me. Uh, was it easy to tell which one was which? It's got the spacing right, it's got the upslant angles right, it's got the form right, but what is fundamentally missing is the fluency. The little nick there, the little nick there. What can you tell from my handwriting then about me? You see, there's some lovely things going on here, the sensitivity, the fluency, the need for information, the, the mental enthusiasm, uh, you know. Does it mean that everything that you can tell with my handwriting, you wouldn't be able to necessarily tell with theirs? You can tell a lot from theirs, but in terms of actual identification, it lacks soul. Is there potential for misuse as it currently stands? You know, there are security problems, clearly, but it's too easy to pick up the fact that one is mechanical and the other is 
by a human being. You know, you're the first ever person that's been positive about my handwriting. <laughs> The handwriting company plans to improve the system so in future you can print your handwritten letters at home, tell your smart home assistant to write something up, and even write with a particular emotion like light and flowing for happy and intense pressure for angry. But until then, it's cursed with my cursive. Hello and welcome to the week in tech. It was the week that the launch of the Samsung bendable Galaxy Fold phone was delayed after early reviewers flipped out over 40 display screens. Google Alphabet subsidiary Wing Aviation is flying high, becoming the first drone delivery service to be certified by the US Federal Aviation Administration, the FAA. And the UK government has reportedly approved the supply of some equipment from Chinese company Huawei for use in the new 5G data network. Some ministers have raised concerns about the decision and its effect on national security, but Huawei has consistently denied that its work poses any risk of espionage or sabotage. Vodafone was the UK's worst mobile network provider for the eighth year in a row, according to a survey from consumer group Which. Vodafone issued a statement apologising to customers, saying we are working hard to understand the issue and what more we can do. Virtual network provider GifGaf came top. Tesla's reported a loss of over £500 million for the first three months of the year. It's also opening an investigation after this video, appearing to show a Model S vehicle exploding in Shanghai, was shared on Chinese social platform Weibo. And finally, a trio of autonomous robots are floating in a most peculiar way, doing astronauts' chores in space. Meet Honey, Queen and Bumble. These are astro bees sent to the International Space Station where they'll be busy. I bet they wish they were up there with Buzz Aldrin. The year is 2040. Welcome to Moon Valley. The newest city in the universe. Home to a thousand people, builders, engineers, farmers, doctors, and every year over 10,000 more come to visit. Sounds great, doesn't it? Which leaves me with just one important question. How on earth did we get here? Moon Valley is the vision of someone we've met before. Japanese company iSpace were one of the teams competing for the Google X Prize, which offered $20 million to the first team to land a rover on the moon by the end of March 2018. No one managed to be ready in time, but several of the projects are still ongoing. The Israeli team recently did reach the moon, but crashed into the surface. And as I found out when I visited their new headquarters in Tokyo, iSpace also haven't given up their lunar ambitions. In fact, they've expanded them. Uh, we've already completed the rover, so we moved to the lander development. iSpace has secured extra funding to put Japan's first lander on the moon. Deployed by a SpaceX rocket, the first one will orbit the moon in 2020, and the second in 2021 will land and deploy two rovers onto the lunar surface. This is the control station for the rover. You've got all your readouts here. You've got what the camera can see here. And weirdly, these are the control units. They're just off-the-shelf modular units that seem to stick together like this. Uh, you have your speed here. You have the distance you want it to travel here, the direction you want it to go there. So you set all those parameters up, and then you press the big button there, and the rover does what you asked it. And then, as long as you haven't put it down a crater or something, <laughs> you can do the next step. I do hope they put some markings on these controls before the mission. As with all space projects, the first few missions will take small steps to test their technology. But all this extra investment is probably due to what iSpace plans to do next. Uh, so hang on, there's a lunar cave. Yes. And you're going to go yeah. towards the entrance of the lunar cave? Yes. What's in the lunar cave? So this is a new discovery. It is uh, very recent. Uh, we still don't know what, what is inside. Oh my goodness, it could be anything. 
Yes. <laughs> but it's probably going to be rocks. Yeah, <laughs> sure. It's recently been discovered that there could be a network of lunar underground tunnels that were once filled with lava, and that these lava tubes could be accessed through caves or skylights at the bottom of craters. These permanently dark, cold areas could contain ice, and iSpace plans to use two rovers tethered together to go find it. By using many networked robots to locate and then mine the ice, iSpace is proposing to use electrolysis to mass produce rocket fuel. This could create a whole industry on the moon, which could then be used as a base to reach further into the solar system. We believe that moon is going to be the stepping stone for the further space development. And then in order to create such a world, we believe that we need to create economy in space. Even the first steps are fraught with difficulty. For example, those first rovers, should they successfully reach the moon, will have to work quickly. A lunar day lasts 14 Earth days, after which there are 14 Earth days of darkness and temperatures so low that they won't survive until the next dawn. But, pff, hey, when it comes to space, these are the sorts of challenges that pioneers relish. And they certainly haven't stopped iSpace from shooting for the moon. Now then, blockbuster film season is fast approaching, so we thought we'd look at the amazing effort that went into creating the world of one of the big children's films of the year, Dumbo. This is Tim Burton's reimagined take on a Disney classic where some of the individual frames took 36 hours to render. And now, introducing our world famous flying elephant. I think initially when I came on board, it was uh, my focus was what's Dumbo going to look like? What has he got to do? What are the practical considerations as well as the design considerations? And how does Tim really want to realise him as a character? Even though Tim wanted something that looked completely photoreal, his unusual design wasn't going to really sit well in a perfectly real world. So we chose not to shoot on location. Uh, we chose to shoot everything on stage uh, and control the lighting and the set design. It was very important that we sort of created not only this sort of this beautiful uh, downtrodden character for the movie with these sort of unusual proportions, but he also lived in a world that was equally sort of designed to, to suit his, um, his character and look as well. Dumbo's animation is incredibly subtle, it's very contained, and most of his emotion is read either through his eyes or a subtlety in the body language, and so the eyes were incredibly important. So it was, it, it was, um, we had to do quite a lot of work to sort of find the right look. And, you know, whilst we're filming, we do everything that we can to make sure we get as much as as much in camera as possible and you know Ed in his Dumbo suit provided you know a, a back for the kids to stroke or something like that um, uh, but you know to make that interaction work we add CG hay on top of him as well just so you know if they're brushing his hands there's something to knock off or you know when we first meet Dumbo and he sort of tumbles out of the train carriage um, you know we had a starting point from a stunt performer rolling down the ramp but Ultimately, we have to create all the, uh, a large volume of hay for him to interact with that can all sort of slide off his head and body. Similarly, you know, water interaction. We did a, a combination of generating um, a lot of computer-generated foam and water elements to sit over our Dumbo. Uh, and we also shot a number of practical elements of just literally foam elements against black that we could then, uh, our compositing team could then add to in the final process of putting the shots together. Welcome to the Medici Family Circus. Where anything is possible. Not just Dumbo, but also the adult elephants in the show, they all require quite an extensive um, rigging process so that the, the animation team may firstly have a really good um, skeletal structure that they can move the joints around and allow them to, sort of, uh, to move as naturally as possible. But there's also all the muscles and, uh, on top of the skeleton and then the, you know, the fat and the skin that all has to interact with that. And one of the kind of real key things that I wanted to make sure that we did on this movie was to 
really capture the sort of the subtlety of motion that you get in elephant skin, which is incredibly loose and stretchy. Um, the way that it sort of expands when a leg moves forward and then contracts again, it creates these different patterns of wrinkles. And some of that uh, detail was really important to capture. And uh, we ended up having to embark on a whole new way of um, creating our sort of uh, skin simulation, uh, for want of a better word. Right wing, check. Left wing, check. Prepare for takeoff. Fantastic stuff. Now then, I've come to East London, where I'm about to make my own great escape. Hi, welcome to Other World, brought to you by the Drum Corporation. Thank you. Would you like to come with me, please? Looking nothing at all like an episode of Black Mirror, this is a virtual reality arcade with a difference. Step into one of the 14 pods, put on the garb, and you'll be transported to Otherworld. I find myself on an island where I'm free to wander about. Wow, sliding down the slide. I like the way that you walk in this game. You squeeze your triggers and then you just do a walking motion with your hands. Being in your own private pod means the environment is controllable. And as you wander into different climates, a rumble pad under your feet and heat lamps and fans, which subtly change the temperature, make this a multi-sensory experience. I can feel the heat on the back of my head now because I'm facing away from the sun. I do like that. Put simply, Otherworld is a way to play many different VR games all in one place, from frantic shoot 'em ups to more serene experiences. But instead of choosing them from a menu, here you wander the islands, just as you wander around a theme park looking for different rides. Right, so the idea is that you don't just walk around this landscape, but you find these pods, and inside each one is a VR game. So I'm going into one called Space Pirate Trainer now. There are 16 games currently available, and in the future, the Otherworld team are planning to allow you to convert points won in-game into real-world tokens to spend at the bar. And although I think my performance is definitely something that belongs behind closed doors, it is also possible to share your experiences with your friends in other pods. I want to know what they're doing in that other pod. <laughs> now, Otherworld is not finished and it's not locked down. It's in continual development in the slightly less glamorous workshop just around the corner. We're always going to be bringing in improvements or taking away features that people don't like or fixing things that don't work. Um, and it's this very fluid development environment where we have an active sandbox literally around the corner of customers going in and using it all day. With one million pounds worth of investment so far, Otherworld certainly looks the part. But as one of the first VR arcades in the UK, it's probably too early to tell if it can keep enough people coming through its doors to keep things afloat. I think that VR can be good in a limited sense in the home, but to get the full experience, it's like going to a proper cinema. And that's what we're trying to do. So we're giving people the space in which to play without having to move all their furniture. And as well, we're upgrading the VR experience, and that's where all of those extra sensory effects, the heat, the wind, the rumble come in to make that virtual reality experience more immersive. <laughs> oh my goodness. That's it from Otherworld. Don't forget, we live on social media. You'll find us there throughout the week on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, and Twitter at BBC Click. Thanks for watching. See you soon, and if you need me, I'll be in my pod. <laughs>